I was on my way with my sister to school. She was getting on to me about making us late. So we got into a little bit of an argument and, uh, and turned into a fight and started to call her names and pull up to the school. And I got out of the car and I slammed the car door shut on her. I had no idea that that would be the last time that I would see her. Columbine is a normal high school and yeah. normal suburb. She knew that something bad was going to happen to her. She was so blunt. She'd say, I'm going to die young. She'd just say it just like that. She was very vocal about her premonition. When the shooters approached the school, these were the stairs that they walked up. And when they got to the top of the stairs, that's when they saw Rachel. Through her writings, there's just an element of premonition and our prophetic. This was more than about me losing a daughter. I heard on the radio that something was going on at Columbine High School. During my lunch period, I went to the school library to study for a test. I heard these poppy noises coming from outside the school. They started to get louder. And then this teacher ran into the room. She was completely frantic. She ran over to the phone to call the police. And while she was on the phone, she kept yelling at all of us to hide and get underneath the tables. As we're hearing the poppy noises, I started to realize that this was serious and just feeling this, this dread feeling come over. And I felt like I heard God speak to me and told me to be still. My two friends, as we realized that these were gunshots we were hearing, as the poppy noises were getting louder, as the shooters came into the school and they were getting closer and closer to the library, just started to freak out. The library was the first room that the two shooters came into, and the first victim was a boy, Kyle, who didn't know to hide. He had a mental disability. His parents said he had the mind like a little kid. He liked simple things, coloring books and panda bears, and he didn't know to hide, and he was a big kid became their first target. Uh, they went around the room, they came over to where Corey was sitting. Corey was a junior. He wanted to be a Marine. And the first thing that Corey did was he put a girl behind him. And uh, as they came over, he was the only person that day to physically jump out and try to stop. And he actually might have been successful, except there were two of them. They came over to where I was. They saw my friend Isaiah, who was next to me. Isaiah was one of the very few black students in, in my school, African-American students. And so one of them called the other one over and said, hey, we have an N-word over here. The other shooter came over and drug Isaiah out from underneath the table, calling him racial slurs. And Isaiah was trying to back up. And Isaiah, the last thing he said was, I want to see my mom. But Isaiah actually was going to be the first person from his family to graduate. And every day he actually had, they had a calendar on the fridge and he would put a red X and he would tell his mom one more day down. We buried Isaiah in his cap and gown. There's a diploma on top of him. And then they turned their guns to my friend Matt and left me underneath that table. And I thought I was gonna die. I, my ears ringing so loud from the shotgun blast, I thought they were bleeding. And, um, feeling so much fear that I felt like my heart was going to stop beating. And I asked God to take away my fear after a few minutes of being feeling that. And um, that's when I thought I heard him speak to me and tell me to get out of there. And so I was the first student in the library to stand up and looked around. I saw the shooters were gone. I wasn't sure if they had left or not, but they were, they had left. I yelled at everyone still in the room, let's get out of here, I think they're gone. I heard a girl asking for help, turn around, there's a girl rocking back and forth, asking for help over and over, and uh, helped to pick her up, and we ran out of an emergency exit. There's a police car, thankfully, outside, and we all run behind the police car, and as soon as we got behind that car, the two shooters were back in the library. So we escaped just in time. The first thing I did was I called my mom and I said, Mom, I'm okay, but I think there's something wrong with Rachel. And I don't even know why I said that. I got home. My family was shocked to see me because I had blood all over my clothes. And we were all 
watching the news and we were waiting to hear from Rachel. We ended up waiting all night. She didn't call. The next morning we got a phone call from uh, the police department and they told us that Rachel was the first one that was killed. My mom came down to tell me the news and I could see on her face that she was just so worried about me and how I was going to take it. All these people that I was praying for, 30 minutes later their brothers and sisters were, uh, they, they were, uh, their brothers and sisters were showing up. But not your sister. A victim of the Littleton tragedy was laid to rest today. Rachel Scott was one of the first to die outside the school. She was Columbine High's golden girl. The little red car Rachel paid for by working in a sandwich shop has become a haunting shrine, still parked at the school lot where she left it Tuesday morning, drawing friends and strangers alike. She was full of life, and anything that she did, she was determined to do and go wherever she wanted to. I think the biggest challenge for me after the shooting was the anger that I was dealing with towards the two shooters. I hated those guys. I used to fantasize what it'd be like to get revenge on them and they were dead and gone. And that anger that I was holding on to started to affect the people that were close to me, my family. And I started to take out that anger on them. I took it out a lot on my little brother, on my mom. I had an attitude at that time. I wasn't like my sister. I wasn't kind or compassionate. I was a jock at school. A lot of times I used humor to make fun of other people, to get my buddies to laugh. I was kind of uh, mean to my sister that last year of her life because she was reaching out to kids that weren't very cool at school. And that's really all I cared about was trying to be popular. I definitely felt broken after the shooting. When we were moving some furniture around on a Christmas day mm. and we moved this dresser and saw this tracing of her hands. She traced her hands like this on the back of an old dresser and wrote, these hands belong to Rachel Joy Scott and will someday touch millions of people's hearts. We started to go through Rachel's possessions. We knew that she had a, a number of journals and she liked writing. And we started to see there was this theme that she had. Just a month before she died, she was in her class. The teacher gives us assignment, and it was, write a paper if you were your best self, what that would look like. She titles it, My Ethics, My Codes of Life. In it, she says, I have this theory. I have this theory that if one person can go out of their way to show compassion, then it will start a chain reaction of the same. People will never know how far a little kindness can go. I began to hear the stories of her and, and read her writings, and she began to really become a, a role model to me after she had, she had passed. I, I didn't know some of the things that she was thinking and feeling. The shooters wanted to make a negative impact on this world, so my decision was that I want to leave a bigger impact, but in a positive way. If I were to meet the shooters now, I wouldn't want revenge on them. I think when I hear their name now, I, I feel, I feel kind of uh, sorry for them. My family, uh, in the months to come, we started to feel a sense of mission with telling Rachel's story. My first presentation I did, I was 18 and I'll continue to share as long as I live, as long as it's making an impact on schools. One of the big things that we're focused on is how you see yourself. Each and every one of us in this room has a great capacity to do great things. I've seen students have a change of heart. I've met students over the years that had planned a school shooting and changed their heart, changed their mind. I challenge students to choose positive influences. Rachel wanted to make a positive difference, so she surrounded herself with the right influences that helped her be a powerful, positive person. I talk about the last time I had with my sister, yelling at her, fighting with her, calling her names. 
And I challenge the students to find five people in their life that mean something to them, that they love, and tell them how much they value them, how much they appreciate them, how much they care about them. And if one person will go out of their way to show compassion, show compassion, then it will start a chain reaction of the same. And people will never know how far a little bit of kindness can go. You just may start a chain reaction. I thought I heard something outside of my window, but I wasn't really sure. And just a few minutes later, I heard someone say, hey girl, I'm coming in. And it was then my window opened all the way and a man came in my window. He shoved me up against my bedroom door, put his hand over my mouth and started punching me in the stomach.